Right, we are shifting gears slightly. We've been uh, running a series of conversations across uh, OTB this week and over the coming weeks indeed about the future of sport in Ireland. We have some great speakers on during the week in topics like player development, participation and dropout rates, resources in underprivileged areas and much more as well besides. But our next stop relates to coaching uh, and coaching the coaches specifically and joining us as someone who's been involved in successful dressing rooms at all levels and in all types of Irish sport. Liam Moggan, good morning to you. Good morning, lads. How are you? Great, thanks, and thanks a million for taking the time this morning to uh, to jump on the line and continue the series of chats that we're having. We uh, we really wanted to speak to you about that element of sort of coaching the coaches and the passion, which I know that you're very strong on. And it struck me that we'd Dermot Ling on as one of the first voices on the on the series this week, and he spoke about the importance of connection with your sport. Um, among your areas, obviously, is coaching the coaches. What's your take on where we sit in this country compared to other countries in terms of the quality of our coaching generally? Okay, we well we we've we've got great iconic coaches, you know, going right back to time when the Irish Wales, the the throwers dominated the world through the field of athletics and through Gaelic football. So our history stands up to any. What distinguishes right now is the huge number of volunteers we have in proportion to the number of volunteers in other countries. Uh, volunteers are, are the backbone of our sport. Uh, generally people who are giving of their free time in the best way they possibly can with the best intentions. And when NCTC, where I started working in 1998, it had been set up in 92, there was a, a, a legendary director there and he did a study of really putting Ireland in its place in the world. And two things stood out from Ireland from a coaching point of view. One was the presence of our own indigenous games and the great influence that the GAA had. And the second one was that our dependency on so many volunteers. Mm. Uh, so on that point, and you mentioned the, the phrase their best intentions, Liam, which sometimes can come as a bit of a, a, a backhanded compliment, right? Uh, so where, where are we at then in terms of the support of those volunteer coaches? Because like in fact what we're talking about is a suite of parents who are out and about trying to do the best for the kids not always brilliantly equipped to do it though that's right the road to hell is paved with good intentions that's the phrase that came to me there when you mentioned it coaching is a skill and i think that's one of the basic fundamental steps the first steps that is missed in the support of coaches and in the ongoing training of coaches is be sitting beside a piano and they've once seen a piano and heard somebody play a piano. We don't assume that they can go over and sit down and play that piano. But we do that in coaching fields and gyms and halls all over. Look, would you go over there and, and, and coach those young kids? And of course, when someone finds themselves in that position, many times they're, they're, they're like any beginner, they're, they're stuck. But unlike many beginners, they're stuck in a live context. There's there's pairs of eyes looking back at them. What do we do next? You know, give us advice, give us praise. So coaching is a skill. Um, and when you mentioned Dermot there, Dermot Ling, you mentioned about a connection to their sport. We definitely need a connection to the sport, but I would say that's the third connection that's needed. One, the volunteer or professional if they are, they need a connection to core coaching skills. Two, they need to be able to connect to the player. Players don't need coaches. All they need is a ball. So they need to be able to engage that person. And thirdly, they need to connect to the game. We coach people who play football. We coach people who run, jump, throw, play golf. So the error in the support or the error in the understanding often is that we coach the game. We don't. It's the third phase in the way I would say we coach one a player. And then we need coaching skills in order to do that. So maybe a bit of a rant, maybe a bit of a high horse from my position, but that, that's the way I see it. And you're entitled to it. Um, we, we might come back to that in just a little bit, but the, the so that idea then of the support, who is it that does it best in this country? Is there like a, a an association or a union or whatever it is that, that jumps out at you as the best, that, uh, you know, best practice in terms of what others might be able to pick from? Okay, well, well, best, I'll, I'll leave be a judgment best out of it. But again, if I get back to the whole concept of the, the, the formal support of coaches that set up in the early 90s, there was an understanding that, that the best people to support coaches were the people from the national governing bodies. 
So again, in the, in the work that NCTC or Coaching Ireland or Sports Coach Ireland, Ireland as it's called now, it wasn't that they were to train the coaches. They would invite the governing bodies to nominate people from their governing bodies who would best go back into the governing body. And the only course then was given to those. So we train, coach, educators. And whether it's best or not, it, it's fluid. The, the whole role of a coach is to implement or to influence change, positive change, improve performance, change in behavior. So the ultimate outcome of any successful coaching is change. It's fluid. It's one after the other. So what may be the best system today may not be the best system next week or next year. It's really that a good support system is in place and the efforts of the people are in the right place to do that. And in the main, most governing bodies are now and have for a while acknowledged that coaches are the bedrock of increased numbers of participation and ultimately then leading on to what we would call uh, performances that would be matched at senior international level. What are the raw ingredients necessary to become a great coach? A statement that Woody Allen made, I don't always agree with, but there's a certain amount in it. He says success is 99% turn, turning up. Um, there are raw skills, as you mentioned there, Owen. I would say that those raw skills are around planning, uh, observation, analysis, asking questions, stepping in, stepping out, staying silent, adapting activities, progressing, giving feedback, motivating. So you can see there's a huge amount into it. Um, and some of those skills are personal traits that people may have learned as being a member of a family or a community or may not have learned as being a member of family or a part of a community. And that's why it's so essential that those skills, raw skills, as you call them, one, they're broken down. And then just like weaving a blanket, each of these skills are trained in their own way. So when they're seamlessly performed by the coach, they don't seem like they're doing much. And these raw skills are best fueled through the personality of the person. We, we lost some great coaches recently in Eamon Ryan the coach of the Cork ladies getting football team and, and, and some men's teams and Jerry Kieran in athletics. They had the raw skills. However, as personalities and as individuals, they were very, very different. And in their application of these raw skills, that they were very different. The key thing is on that, that they had them. They knew how to introduce, to demonstrate, to explain, to adapt, uh, to make the complex simple. Can you explain that a little bit, Liam? It's it's interesting that you brought up those two examples. It definitely does feel on the outside looking in that they approached coaching in two very different ways. Uh, what's your opinion on that? And and was it as different as it seemed? I think it was. I was lucky to know both, both of them from, from a periphery. Um, both were present. Both had a passion. Uh, both had great knowledge of their sport. And yet that was banked and very few of the comments made about them since their, their passing recently was about how knowledgeable they were in their sport. They spoke about a passion they had for their sport. Uh, it was spoken about the connection they had with each and every body. And I suppose if you're to have that connection with somebody, you, you give of your time to find out, well, what's the best next step to that person? Sport and coaching is never about you. It's not, not, not all about you, Dad, Roisin, my daughter said to me once and survived. But it was very, very significant because it isn't about you. It isn't about the sport. It is always about the person who's in front of you. So your ability to give them time to connect with them and to be able to analyze and decide what is the best next step for them is always the it's it's always the challenge coaching the sport is 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 a flawed way about it but it misses out on the dynamic of this complex unpredictable wonderful flawed confusing frustrating person that's in front of you but that that that's that's your work it's it's with them the ultimate the best coach of every 
coach is the player. And of course, the person who's responsible for the performance is the player. So it fits in with the coach's role of stepping back. My, my job here is just to assist. It's to support. It's to encourage and, and get off the stage then when they're performing. For Jerry Kiernan to have finished in the top 10 in an Olympics marathon would have required him to think all about himself. Is that a challenge that you've seen over your years of experience where people who have succeeded as sports people have struggled as coaches because they need to go from being like the, the, having the level of selfishness that is required to succeed and then going to a level of selflessness that is required within coaching? Yeah, great, great performers of any kind owner are self-centered. They, they think of themselves first. Uh, they're not selfish. Selfish is thinking of yourself only. But as you, let's say in, in my own case, from, from coaching athletics, from being able to run with the athletes I was helping, being able to feel the pace of the run and the, the duration of the interval, that was a relatively easy coaching role. The real essence of the coaching role happened when I was no longer able to run with them. And now I had to really fulfill the role as people would see it, observing, analyzing, trial and error, getting feedback from those. Both pe people I mentioned were very high performers in the sports they came from, Gaelic football and athletics. It's a separate role to coaching and very few actually make that jump. Not all great performers become great coaches. Some extraordinarily gifted coaches were never great performers. So it's whether or not they perform or not is irrelevant. It's whether they take on that specific role of a coach, someone who is there to serve, is there to help somebody else. Liam, I'm conscious of the, the, and I'm conscious of putting you on the spot with this next question, but that uh, we would have a, like a bunch of people who are watching us this morning or, or over the weekend who themselves will be some of those well-intentioned parents or whatever it might be on the, on the sidelines. What are there three things that you see happening regularly or three things that you might be able to recommend as um, work-ons or, or, or ideas or advice, maybe best way of putting it for, um, okay. for volunteer coaches? Okay, well, I, I applaud all volunteer coaches, first of all. I think, I think that they're wonderful, the fact that they have actually committed to, to be there. But the first thing I'd say would be a slightly negative. We make the assumption that all players want to be coached. It's an assumption that as soon as they arrive in the club, it's nearly like we provide a hurdle to stop them being active. You, you've got to wait till the coach is here. You've got to wait till the coach sets up a structure. So the first thing I would say is don't don't, don't get, get in their way of letting them play. Let, 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 let them play. Um, to deal with the individual, the knowledge or lack of knowledge you may have in the sport can both get in your way. You may know too much, you may know too little, but it's the person that's there in front of you. So don't assume they need coaching. Two, concentrate on the person. And three, I would say, encourage yourself and support yourself by seeking assistance. Go and ask other coaches, parents to, to have a look. Ask the young kids, what did you like today? What would you like to start with the next day? Now you're beginning to engage on a kind of review of yourself. Um, and fourthly, if I can put in, keep your passion. Why did you want to coach in the first place? That passion can be dampened. It can be dampened by comments. It can be dampened by what you see in front of you. It can be dampened by results. Keep, serve that passion. Why, why do you want to do it? Get, get back to that on a regular basis. Hmm. You can go to 10 if you want, Liam. There's no, uh, no limit on it. <laughs> do, you, do you find that, um, like that is, is it, is it the exception or the rule that people want to be, you know, like I, you know, we've had a kid and I'm going to become the next Jose Mourinho out of this or that, um, that is that the exception of the rule that people sort of really fancy themselves as being a coach and try to insert themselves. Cause I was interested here. The first thing you say was get out of the way. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges facing coaching on is that if we, if we look for best practice in all, in all things, you know, you would look to the best presenters. You'd look for the, the, the picture, the, the demonstration, the video of the best. And that, a lot of the demonstrations we get of coaching is not good practice. It's visually very attractive to see the coach shout, roar, throw the head, walk up and down sidelines, intrude onto the pitch. It's, it's great visuals, but it isn't good coaching practice. 
So one of the great difficulties of someone accepting how can I become the next great coach is really accepting what is great coaching. It's, it's to be calm. It's to be still, encouraging, smiling, watching. It isn't good visuals. Now, that takes someone that needs to be very confident in their own skin in order to do that. And, and sadly, not enough coaches embrace the role they have in encouraging other coaches. A lot of practice that we see is not best practice and, and even say it's not effective coaching because any player that's on the pitch of any age that needs a person ranting and raving and shouting and roaring on the sideline, well, the job hasn't been done in training. So you, you need to get that back, back off. So I'd say anyone who, who is ambitious is find out what are the skills of good coaches and be happy in your own skin that through your own personality, you, you, you're going down that road. Yeah. I, I'm sure everybody watching and listening this morning has done the same thing that I've done, and there's been a rush of names that have come into my head since you've started to describe that ranter, ranter and raver on the uh, on the touch. <laughs> it might be better, best served not to get into too much of that. Can I ask you just finally the last one for me? I might want to come in afterwards, but the last one for me just is because it was a conversation uh, that we've been having over the last while about early specialisation, and I remember in the middle of last year the FAI making recommendations via rude doctor about. Um, specialising in soccer from the age of 12 at the expense of everything else. We had Stuart Lancaster on last night who was very much a proponent of the opposite and he's come through perhaps a similar-ish route to yourself um, uh, with a, a PE background and through to the academy, international level and elite club obviously as well. But the value of, of, of all sports for, for kids of that sort of 10, 12 and upwards, from your experience, Liam, what's, the, what's your best advice on that? But let's look at it this way on all all athletes are going to slow down eventually no matter whether they're olympic performers whether they're your average club recreational as they age they're, they're going to get slower they're not going to be able to perform to that level so let's say that we have that window of performance in a performance related not not not, not just a health basis so now we have got that window really sport in, in the role of the development of that person is just to make them a better person. It isn't to only make them a better player. So I would say that the wider the experience people get for the greatest duration of time should be the focus of any coach. Now, there are some sports, swimming and gymnastics would stand out where they are early spe specialization is required. But in many, many other sports, we have many, many examples of people who had a wide experience of a wide variety of sporting activities before they then specialized. So just like in our development of any youngster, we don't, we don't specialize in just giving them a certain amount of food or watching one TV program or doing one particular thing. We, we broaden that out. So I would prefer to see the role that there's a certain window in a person's life where coaches can have an influence towards improved performance. Let's maximize that in a holistic way so that when that period is over, they're the best kind of person we'd like to be living beside, living with, in the community, back into our sport. I, I think that gives us a, a bigger role of the vocational role that coaches play. Who's the best coach in Ireland? Oh, well. <laughs> Do you, many of our best coaches are not in Ireland on. Many of our, our best coaches, for whatever reason, are not here. And I think really you've touched a nerve there. What, why are some of our best coaches not in Ireland? And I think that gets down to a number of reasons. But for, from what I would see within a system is that the best coaches have an, a massive passion for what it is they do. And people with passion can get in the way of slick systems. They're awkward. They're thinking about it all the time. They all the time want improvements. They're asking questions. So there's no, I would say, I would say, and I would give due credit, anyone who's down in the field, who's in the gym, who's beside the pool, anyone who's encouraging someone else to take part in sport, I'd say we don't have to put bad or good or whatever. And, and look, let me add it another way, Owen. If you're to ask me, have I seen many bad coaches, I say, no, I haven't. I could see coaches that you could see areas of improvement in. 
But have I seen a coach and say, wow, they are really, really poor? No, I haven't. So just like when we start a piece on the piano, we may not be good at it. The, the notes of that piece are not going to change, but over time, our execution of it will get better. So I would say, look, be, be the best you can be today and keep on working at that and you'll become better. So that, that's the way I'd phrase that rather than who's the best. And also it'll allow me to keep more friends within coaching. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, I feel this is maybe just the start of something rather than the end of it. So I really enjoyed that chat over the last 20 minutes or so. Thanks a million for joining us. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Take care. Thank you for asking me.